even though I park in faculty places with a faculty permit. So I support the university through my parking ticket payments. Uh, we have a very serious science staff. Dr. Tim Brown is a very famous scientist in solar physics as well as uh, spectroscopy, um, photometry, and he was one of the first people to, to invent and perfect a new way to discover extrasolar planets. I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. Um, Andrew Pickles is another astronomer who essentially spent almost 15 years on the top of Mauna Kea working with telescopes there, so he's very experienced at running telescopes. Uh, and basically we have uh, 17 total PhDs in astronomy in our organization. And by the way, in 2005, in June 1st, there was exactly one person who worked for this organization, namely myself. So it's built from nothing. Our goal is to do original science, and we're doing that through collaborations primarily, rather than have our people do everything by themselves. We, we have going to have over 120,000 hours of observing time every year. The average observatory with one telescope has at most 3,000 hours. So you can imagine that we are going to be flooded with telescope time, flooded with images, couldn't possibly do the science without collaboration. So this will be the basis of a very, very broad collaboration of a, probably upwards of 150 scientists around the world. And of course, the secret of that is, since we're not gonna ask anyone to pay for the telescope time, we do have a quid pro quo. You must work with the learners. <laughs> so we think we can build a really nice education system out of this. And of course, we're, we're a member of a number of major scientific consortiums as well. These uh, three I listed here, uh, four I listed here, are all very large survey telescopes that go looking for things that go bump in the night. And they'll produce triggers that say, ah, there's a new supernova here, or there's a new XYZ here. And then we can go chase them. Uh, we have an education staff, I won't belabor the names, but basically, uh, we have a director of education in England, and then we have a number of people here, and then we have one uh, postdoctoral type person who's half time on our salary, who does nothing but develop a local educational presence in Hawaii. Because we want the Hawaiians to use the telescope we have, and we've had a hard time getting things started until we actually staffed it. Uh, we're focus on science is pretty simple. Uh, sort of three things here that sort of we sort of imply. One is uh, exploding anything. Quasars, gamma ray bursts, variable active galactic nuclei, and most importantly, supernova. Stars that basically blow up. They blow up in a certain controlled way, and they blow up, and when they blow up, they have a certain brightness. And since if you can figure out how they blew up, you know their brightness, but they're dim, that means they're far away. If they're bright, that means they're close. It's called the standard candle, and we can use that to probe the structure of the universe out to about halfway to the Big Bang. Even with our little telescopes, we can make a, a big contribution to this, and we're working on that. Um, stellar oscillations or stellar variability is the second thing we're really interested in. Uh, stars change in ways that are very subtle. Why would this be important? Because by better understanding the models of how stars work and reconciling them with the actual data on how stars behave, we can calibrate those models. The better we're able to calibrate those models, the better we're able to understand stellar evolution and that might have some impact on even the Earth. I mean, why do we know that our sun is always as stable as it is? What if it decided to produce 5% more energy or 6% less energy? Those would have huge impacts on humanity. We have no idea. We're just acting essentially on, well, it's been stable for as long as we've been noticing it, so it must be okay. But maybe it isn't. So. There's a lot to learn, but they're very subtle effects. They're barely understood in the stellar models. 
The third thing we do, it's over on the, let's see, that's the right. This is my left, but that's your right. This, this picture here is what's called a gravitational lens. Now, what's going on here is imagine the Earth is here. The center of our galaxy is here, 30,000 light years away. And somewhere around 20,000 light years away, there's a star. And that star gets between a star that's in the center and the Earth, and there's a star in the middle, exactly in the middle. It acts like a lens. Its gravity acts like a lens. And so the light from the far star gets focused. And so while these stars, I have to keep the microphone going, pass in front of you're the Earth, I'm the galaxy, and this is the star. And as the star passes in front, that magnification occurs. And that is basically this. And that magnification can be a hundred times. Now it turns out we're only looking at the center of the galaxy. For those of you who really know the sky, it's between Scorpio and Sagittarius, and that's a late summer constellation low on the horizon here. It's about there, okay, on our sky. I think I have my south direction correct. Okay, so fine, isn't that cool? Wow, one star went in front of another. But on this middle star, if there happens to be a planet going around it, and everything is lined up just right, you get these blips. Now, these are all different telescopes in here. But you can see a really good data curve we got. These green guys are our telescope. Um, this was the first full-scale discovery by LCOGT of an extrasolar planet done by one of our people. So that represents a Jupiter-like planet going around an M star, which is a small, colder, redder star than the sun. But it's still a very, very exciting discovery. OK, our observatories for a minute. We have two two-meter telescopes in Hawaii on Maui, on the top of Haleakala. If any of you are ever at Maui, all you have to do is let us know, and we'll arrange a tour. Um, we're putting 24 small 16-inch telescopes, 0.4-meter telescopes, in clusters of three in eight sites around the world. Those will be for a mixture of science and for educational use. And then we're building approximately 12 to 16 1-meter telescopes and putting them around the world in two pairs, two, two, pairs, two at each of the same eight sites. Um, and then we have built a telescope, a 32-inch telescope, that's out in Sedgwick Reserve. It's called the Nell Byrne Observatory, after a person who was a very committed volunteer there. Um, and um, the Nell Byrne Observatory is available for use by local schools, including here, local astronomy classes. And of course, we use it for primarily debugging our instruments. And it's a, it's a really serious telescope. Uh, we can do a lot of things. I won't belabor it. This is a little bit on the scientific side. But basically, the most important thing we can do is what's called TOO, Target of Opportunity. We have a whole observatory that's built on the principle that what you think you're going to observe right now is not as interesting as something that just happened. And that means we have to reschedule our telescopes in literally a second and potentially send commands out to the telescopes all over the world to reconfigure their observing programs. And there's a supercomputer in Goleta that does this. It's just a simple matter of lots of complicated software to make that happen. Um, we have real-time schools observing uh, on all the sizes of the telescopes from learners of all ages all over the world as part of what we do. Um, and we have all kinds of stuff here that isn't probably as important. But one of the things we've done 